So the point of this talk is to give you, like, you know, dip your toe into the water, give you some starting point so that you can start thinking about, do I need procedure uh, audio in my game? And if yes, where do I start? So uh, Rupesh already actually introduced everything. I don't need to say much. Uh, programmer, technical artist, art director, I live in Berlin. And beside all the professional stuff, I love to experiment with new techniques, like be it programming, be it uh, mathematics or whatnot. I love to learn, and I like to write about them. Um, I have a blog where I post all this information and share it with other people. You can see some of these projects here. So on the right, you have multi-scattering on the screen space in Fog, um, ready for VR usage. Or then on the left, you have compute shaders in Unity doing, uh, well, fluid simulation. So if you'd like to know more, you can either go on my website, where all the links are, or you can go to my Twitter. So we wait for the video to load. Perfect. This is Procedural Audio. Um, this was a, was a project done on a weekend. Um, I didn't go out there and sample some piano. No one played anything here. I'm also not using any library. Everything is done with few lines of code in Unity. Because it's done procedurally, you can do a bunch of stuff. Like, you can change the speed of the playback. You can play different pieces. Um, you could, if you don't like piano, you could turn that to an oboe or contrabass or whatever you want it to be with just slight minor changes. You might say, I don't need a piano in my game. Fair enough. Uh, I have never needed a piano in my game either. You can do much more with procedural generation. So first, let's address the question, why procedural generation to begin with? All the advantages why you would want to do procedural generation for audio are exactly the same advantages why you would want to do it for anything else, like visuals, it's all the same. Basically, when you're doing procedural generation, it's about looking at an output and try to analyze different components that make that output unique, that makes us realize that, okay, that's, that's the output. And because you're constructing these mathematically, one of the main advantages, the first thing you get is endless variations. <clears throat> for example, the, uh, the image you see here is all done procedurally in shader. I, no image is being used, no texture is being used. Everything is defined mathematically. And one of the main advantages of this is that this can run for 20 hours, and practically no one is going to notice a repetition. So there is no point where the loop is going to start itself again. And that's equally true for audio. Audio would be exactly the same. The other advantage is because we are using mathematical formulas to define different part of the effect we want to create, and formulas take parameters, by defining meaningful parameters, we can easily adjust those input parameters to just get completely different outputs. For example, here, if I wanted to, I could easily change how many valleys and peaks are in the mountains, how dense the clouds are, or if the player just decides to destroy one of those mountains, I can easily adjust for that. This is great news because games are interactive. I think that's not news to anyone. And having procedural generation or content that's reactable to, to your player environment and player input is just amazing. One of the last advantages is it's very memory efficient. So you could sit, OK, you couldn't, but theoretically, an artist could sit and paint every tree variation you see here. But you would be talking about hundreds of gigabytes of uncompressed image, whereas the code that's generating this is under a kilobyte. So keep that in mind. As I said before, all these advantages are also true for audio, right? It's the same thing for audio. So I'm going to give you some examples how that's the case. Um, imagine you have an engine sound in your, in your game. Like you could be having a racing game, or maybe you have some sort of spaceship. And the main point is the engine sound is going to be played hours after hours. You could go out there, find an engine you fancy, and you're like, that sounds great, and just record it, right? The problem is the recording has to end at some point. One minute, two minutes, three minutes. The longer the player is exposed to the sound you're playing for them, the more likely that they are going to notice the patterns in your recording, the unique individual sounds that pop up, and the more annoyed they get with the repetition. Thankfully, an engine sound is very easy to do mathematically. You can just construct it mathematically, and then you can play this thing for 50 hours ahead. No one would notice any repetition. Engine sounds are not the only thing that are easy to model mathematically in your game. Um, there are a bunch of other sounds that are also useful, like a sound of a waterfall, or maybe a sound of a highway in some faraway place, or bullets flying, clicks and UIs. Or maybe you have a game like Mario, and you have to collect a lot of coins, or you're getting a lot of points. 
uh, all these sounds are very easy to do mathematically, and they all have something in common. They are either being played for a long extended period of time, or you have to replay the same sound hundreds and hundreds of times, and players could get very irritated if the sounds are not, if the sounds are always the same and there is a pattern. To the second point, because again you are defining these different characteristics of a sound individually as components, you can easily modify those behaviors to make it sound like the sound is being played under a different condition. Imagine you have a shooting sound. You could easily modify that sound mathematically so that it sounds like it came from a broken gun or a gun that's in a humid space, or maybe the physical space around the player changed. For the last point, let's say you have a procedure generation game and you have hundreds of thousands of animals and guns and whatnot. Again, you could sit, uh, you could let a sound designer create a unique sample for each individual object. That would be madness and also practically not doable. But you could do that and you could have 100 gigabytes of data which um, the player needs to download when they want to play the game. Um, anyone who has done AAA titles nowadays knows that you have to download 100 gigabytes before you start playing and a lot of that is uncompressed audio. Um, because audio is just expensive. So if you do these things procedurally, you would have saved yourself a lot of space, as well as it's just practically easier to do. Once you define the mathematical formula, the model, you could generate endless variation, as I said before. And if you have the need in your game to create a bunch of sounds that are of the same family, but slightly vary in characteristic, procedure generation is the thing to go. Uh, it could really help you out. So uh, I hope with that I gave you some idea of why people do position generation in their game or why you might want to do the same. Um, we have to talk about some theory of sound in order to be able to, for you to be able to follow the slides I'm gonna give you later. So let's just go over that. Just keep in mind, sound is not complicated, but it's extensive. So what I'm going to be talking about is an oversimplification to the point where some points are just plain out wrong but it's more than enough for you to understand why and how we do procedural generation. Imagine you have a plate and you can move this plate up and down, right? That's all you want to do. And you do a simple movement. You push the plate all the way up to maximum displacement and you push it down again to minimum displacement. By pushing this plate up, you push the air particles around the plate also up. These particles also in turn push the particles around them. So each group pushes the neighboring group so what you have done, you created a disturbance in the air, and disturbance travels along the direction of your plate's movement. The correct term for that is propagate, fancy word. It just means it moves. So that's kind of how that would look like. The red dots are, um, well, let's say the, the particles in your medium that are, the sound is traveling through. And as you can see, they get pushed away from their resting position and they have a tendency to want to go back to the resting position. Once the displacement is to the maximum, they kind of go back. If the, you were going to graph, um, like draw a graph of how much displacement is happening over this distance and how it's changing over time, you get the blue graph there. That might look like a wave to you. It is what it is. It's, it's a, practically a single wave peak. It's a wave front. And that's why we talk about waves when we are talking about sound. So, Next step, we have a thin membrane that we place somewhere further away from our plate. The only characteristic of this membrane needs to be that it needs to be able to freely vibrate as your disturbance is passing through it with the air particles around it. So it gets pushed back and forth just like your plate does. So what you have done is you have communicated some sort of, you have sent some sort of signal across space. Why is it a signal? Where well, you have a body that you control and you have an unrelated body you do not control and you manage to somehow mirror the movement of your body in, in the foreign body. If you have some sort of sensory information connected to this thin membrane, let's say it measures, for example, how much displacement is happening, well, you manage to send actual information across space. And I think that's amazing because what's the information here? Well, it's the movement behavior of the plate. Your uh, membrane can record that. So this is the part where I'm going to do, uh, let's say, the ridiculous oversimplification. We are going to call that red black box, box sensory system the human hearing system, which is just practically untrue. That's not how the hearing system works. Uh, we measure frequencies more, more than uh, displacement itself. But it's good enough for us. And the plate, 
it's very closely what the speaker cone does. So that's what your computer's speaker does. You do not have to, of course, move a single time, right? You can just keep going back and forth. You could move your plate in a random pattern, so that would be noise, or you could move it in a in a like a repeating pattern. That would be cyclical. It would be periodical. Not every disturbance you create is a sound. Why not? When you have to talk about when you're talking about sound, we need to talk about frequency, which is one of the terms that you're going to hear the most in audio engineering, um, well as well as graphics. Frequency is about so, has something to do with how fast that plate is moving. So. The simplest movement we can do, we start from zero, go max displacement, go back to zero again. Frequency is about how many times are you going to do this movement, this whole movement, per unit time. That would be per second here. Do it once, you have a frequency of one. Do it 20, you have a frequency of 20. If you do it between 20 to 20,000 times, you have sound. Why is that sound? because that's the range that our human hearing system picks up and sends a signal to our brain and says, you just heard a sound. Everything else uh, you could experience as a vibration. That's basically what it is, it's vibration in the air. Or if the frequency is very, very high, you might experience it as a uh, temperature. So that was all to the theory. Now the question is, can we program this, right? That's why we are here. Can you program this? Well, of course you can. Why not? Right? Like, why wouldn't you be able to? You have speaker cone. It needs one float parameter, which is the amount of displacement. And if you manage to somehow hook up that float parameter to the line of your code, whatever the interface, then you could practically make any sound that exists out there. Of course, you have the limitation of your uh, speaker how fast it can move, and how loud the sounds are that it generates, but we put that to the side. There are a lot of sounds you could create, obviously. Um, I'm going to focus on the simplest mathematical sound that we can create so that we can talk about more implementation stuff. Um, that's a pure tone. What's a pure tone? A pure tone is just a single frequency. we have got to model it using a sinus or a sine wave. Um, that doesn't have anything else in it. You hear pure tone only from synthesizers, in reality, any sound you see out there has more than one frequency inside. And it usually is not just repeating patterns, there is also some noise inside. So what we're doing is we are taking a sinus wave and we are just plugging that directly as a position. The output is going to be the position of our speaker cone. The reason why that wave is moving is because our input is time and time moves. So simple stuff. That's how it looks like in code, like soda code. We have a simple wave function. We are using the scene or the sinus. We have a frequency which determines what tone we are going to hear. And time is our main input, which is what changes and the reason why um, the wave moves, the, the graph that you saw moves. Whatever comes out of this wave function goes directly and becomes the position of our speaker. Cone, not the speaker. I hope the speaker doesn't move in your house. Um, so here's problem number one. Speakers don't take functions, they take samples. There are many reasons why that's the case. I don't have the time to go into that. Uh, if you want to, you can ask about that later or just look for me and ask. Um, but what, does samples, what do samples even mean? That, that would be good to know. Samples are just a different way of passing on information, right? Um, when you have a function, you describe practically everything about that behavior. Right? Someone can take that function and knows what the behavior is going to be at any given point in time. Samples, however, are just giving the information of, okay, I don't know everything about that behavior, but I know that at this given time, the output is going to be this number. So they are a pair of input and output. Visual example, you have the blue graph there, which is a simple wave function. Those red dots are samples taken at regular intervals. So you're saying, for example, for time one, I know that the output is going to be one, for time two is going to be minus one. That's what a sample is. When we're talking about samples in terms of audio engineering, we are typically talking about for this given time input, so for this given timestamp, the position of the speaker cone or its displacement 
is this amount, usually normalized between minus 1 and 1. Your speaker, of course, needs to know more than that. It doesn't need to just know where the... For example, let's say you tell the speaker, okay, at time 0, you're at 0. At time 1, you're at 1. The speaker says, hey, I still need to know what to do at 0 0.5, right? So Because the speaker needs to continuously move. There are different ways of reconstructing the function. That's what happens later, is that you take those samples, and by the way, you can, as a human, right, you look at all those dots, and you can do a pretty accurate guess of how the original function looked like. And that's what function reconstruction is about. If you want to know for 0 0.5, where you have no samples, you just look at the time 0 and the time 1, and you say, hey, uh, it's, the output is probably halfway between the sample 0 and the sample 1, because we're at 0 0.5. And that's what's happening here, like a um, simple interpolation, which gives us the original function back, which is what the speaker needs. How many samples do you need? So on the top right, we have a fairly high frequency function. That's uh, a lot of peaks and valleys. And we only take three samples. And look at those three dots. Even if I give it to you as a human, just based on those three dots, there is no way you could accurately guess the shape of the original function. How should the computer be able to do that? As a general rule, you need at least twice as many samples as the frequency you're trying to portray. Right? What does that mean for sound? So as I said before, our human range is between 20 to 20,000 hertz. I say our human uh, range, but however, most adults don't hear up to 20,000. They hear up to like 15,000, especially if you like, like heavy metal or something. Chances are you're not going to hear even 15,000. But babies hear 20,000 quite well. Um, that means that if you want to do 20,000 frequency hertz, you need to have at least 40,000 samples per second. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to accurately represent uh, those frequencies. So problem number one. Our game code runs 30 FPS, or 90, or 60, or whatever. In order to present, like if you had a system where every time the speaker needed a sample, it would have to line a line of a call, a line of code of yours, well, you would have to do that, uh, I don't know, 40,000 times a second. That would be nuts. That means your game needs to have 40,000 FPS. That's just not doable. That means that somehow you have to come up with a system where you provide these samples to your speaker in batches. And instead of providing them one by one, you tell the speaker, hey, look, I'm going to give you a thousand samples. You play that for the coming second. Once you're done, come back to me. I will give you another thousand samples for the coming second as well. And that's basically what we need to do. So let's talk about implementation in Unity. Um, so far, so good. What I have talked about so far is true for any system. You could do the same in Unreal. You could do the same in anywhere. But this is specifically for Unity now. There are a bunch of different ways of uh, doing all the procedural audio in Unity. Um, the way I found most, co uh, most convenient was using the on audio filter read or read. I, I don't know if that's past tense or present. English language is unfortunately very ambiguous there. So I'm just going to say on audio filter read. Um, what that does is it tends. It creates a filter for you. So you, that's just a function you put in a C-sharp file. You attach that C-sharp file as a component to a game object that has an audio source. When there's an audio source on a game object, Unity knows, OK, this game object somehow is going to contribute to the creation of the sound for this frame. right? So when you attach that specific line of code, it creates like an injection point where you can manipulate the data that the speaker is going to receive or practically provide these samples for your speaker. So that's the goal. The function just gives you a place where you can mathematically create these samples that are going to be passed to your speaker. There are a bunch of default uh, parameters in Unity which you need to be aware of. Um, like I said, you need 40,000 samples at least. Uh, Unity by default has 48,000 samples, which is a pretty common default uh, in a lot of applications. I'm not really actually sure why it's 48,000 and not 40,000 now that I think about it, but I can think about that later. So that's one of the defaults that you can change. The other one is how many samples do you put in a batch? Per default, Unity does 1,024. The larger your batch, of course, the less your code needs to be called, but also the higher the latency of player input and changes in the sound. So 
We can do a little bit of maths here. If you have to provide 48,000 samples a second in batches of 1,024, that means you need to call that function on audio filter red 47 times a second. That's a very important point to notice. When you have an audio filter red next to, let's say, update, these are being called at different frequency. They're completely different threads. It's not the same thing. Keep that in mind. It's an important got you. It gets people a lot of times. So let's look at the function signature. You have an array of data, array of floats. That's the data array. That is basically your input and your output. It's the positions of your speaker at any given time. Why is it also input? Well, you could, this is a filter, right? In a chain of various filters connected together. You could have that your previous filters are doing things like reading from an audio source or doing reverb or echo, or you're procedurally generating audio elsewhere. So that's where the information is going to be from the previous samples. That's also where you put your information to pass it on to the speaker. <coughs> Excuse me for the cough. Um, yeah, so how many stuff are in the data? How many samples do you have? Well, obviously, your default parameter, right? It was 1,024, so that's how many samples you have in there. Except that's not exactly the case because you have the concept of channels. If you have a stereo sound in your game, you, you want a different sound for your left ear as your right ear, so you have number of samples per batch times the number of channels. If you only have for left and right ear, that's good. You might have back and forth or whatever. So that's uh, how you populate that array. We basically have everything we need in order to be able to generate a simple sound. And we are going to, well, that could be a black box function. It could do whatever you want. But the function we are going to do is the wave function, the simple pure function. There's only one last got you left we need to talk about, and that's the concept of time and samples. So if you remember, our function took in frequency, which is up to you, whatever frequency you want to play. And it also took time as an input. You need to keep in mind, when you're populating this array, so iterating through all your samples and just fill it up with your procedural sound, that these different entries in the array represent different time stamps, right? So if this code is being called at time zero, your first sample is for time zero. Your second sample, however, is for some point in the future. So you're projecting this function into the future. You're calculating where should the speaker be in the future. Right? How do you know the actual time sample? Well, that's easy. If you have to provide 48,000 samples a second, the time distance between these different samples are 1 over 48,000. That's just the distance between them in time. So your first would be at 0, second would be 1 times 48,000, second would be 2 times 1 over 48,000, third would be 3 times 1 over 48,000. And that's basically what's happening there. So projecting this function into the future, calculating the output, putting it in our array. So um, that was that. You put that in your Unity project, and you hear your first procedural sound. That's just ridiculously easy, right? Like, now comes the hard part. <laughs> how do you actually do that mathematically? Like, how do you construct the models? Very good question. That's a topic for another talk. Um, I realize that's very cliffhanger y, but I could talk about that for like five hours. Um, but I'm going to give you resources to you know, continue learning there and come up with the sounds that you need in your game. What I am going to talk about, however, is some general ways that people use in order to be able to, you know, create those mathematical models. Most common way. You want to create an actual real life sound, typically. So you, what you need, references. You go out there, if you want to create an engine sound, you go and record an engine you want to imitate. Then you go back home and you start listening and analyzing that source you're looking to, like a painter who's trying to paint a tree, and they try to understand what makes a tree, like in a platonic way. What, what makes a tree tree? Is it like the texture? Is it the shape? What is it? So once you start identifying those different components, you try to model those components individually, mathematically, and like put them, composite them together in one giant output. In terms of sound, if you have an engine sound, there's a noise component to it because engines, you know, have a lot of random sounds inside. There's maybe a rhythmic sound to it that goes ta 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 ta. You might want to replicate that. So you write those down, and you have a bunch of tools. One of the tools that you have is Fourier transforms. You take your samples and you convert it to frequency domain. 
That's a fancy way of saying is that you extract the information of what frequencies are actually in that sound uh, source. That's great because you look at the frequency and you look at how they are changing over time in volume and you know how to create frequency. We did that in this slide. It's very simple. So you just call that sinus function as, for as many frequencies as you have and there you go. You have your sound. It's done. Second path. You can do pre-recorded samples and manipulate them mathematically. That's similar to, instead of painting on a blank canvas, you could do a photo collage, like take a bunch of pictures, put it on the canvas, and then paint over it, or just like mess it up somehow. A lot of games do this, uh, especially for music. A lot of games do, because some sounds are really hard to do mathematically. Human singing is very easy to do mathematically, just the vocals. Human speech is very hard to do mathematically because you have all that tonality going up and down, volumes and so on and so forth. So you could pre-record some stuff that are hard to do and then combine them together. Um, procedural music really uses that a lot. You, you know, come up with a bunch of motifs, you record those motifs, and based on player input, you combine those motifs based on rules in order to create a music that's interactive to player input. You can think about games like No Man's Sky or uh, Hades from Super Dragons. So last part, you can actually understand the mathematical under underlying rules. Just like we have PBR, physically based rendering, that tries to understand how does light scatter physically and try to replicate that in the shaders for shading, you can have physically based sound. Any sound generated anywhere is created by vibrating bodies. Vibrating bodies follow the rules of physics. Rules of physics are modeled using mathematics. So if you understand those, you could create whatever sound you want. Practically, however, that's not a way to go usually for real time for two reasons. One, you need to go and understand physics papers, which for anyone who has done it is not, it's not a pleasant experience for a programmer. A lot of uh, jargons and uh, words that are more complicated than they need to be. Second, it's very intensive to calculate, right? You have to come up with this huge system to just generate the sound of like going doo -doo and that's just like, come on, I can, I can record that in 10 seconds. Why would you want to do that? So um, that was it. Further readings. Uh, I am aware that this is nowhere near enough for you to go and make the game sound you want in your game. Um, so that's why I'm going to give you some further resources. So you can go there, read more about it. You could go and read my blog post, Real-Time Procedural Audio and Synthesize Piano in Unity 3D. That's an entire example of I have a sound I want to create. I go in and think about it. What are the characteristics I want to imitate? Looking at examples, looking at resources. How do I create that mathematically? How do I do that programmatically? What are some of the got use implementation in Unity? So I have that all very well recorded there. And you should go and have a look at that. And I also have a bunch of federal resources. You can go there to learn a bit more about procedural sounds. One of those resources which gets an special mention is Designing Sound by Andy Fernell. I hope I didn't murder that name. It looks fairly straightforward, but you never know. Might be French. Um, so that one is worth looking into. It's the Bible of procedural sound. Everyone has read it. Um, it goes into theory quite deep. Like you're not going to have any questions on left once you come out of that book. Unfortunately, the implementation that he does is not using any programming language. It's a visual thing. It's a visual not based stuff that are kind of hard to follow. But you can extract learnings from that and apply it to Unity however you wish. So I hope you took some value from this talk. And if you have any question, I would gladly take it. That was fast. But... <laughs> Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, I enjoyed the talk, by the way. Thank you so much for thank you very much for coming. Uh, thing. And uh, so we, you were describing like uh, procedural music versus proce and uh, procedural sounds and stuff. Yeah, there's like the, the already like the difference between sound and music, SFX and like background music and like games that uh, make music on the fly while you yeah. while you play and stuff. Those have a huge different like. Uh, different types of ways, ways of implementation. How do you, like, uh, as a designer and a programmer, like, do you consider them to be, like, the same type of uh, sounds or something, like, uh, part of a soundscape or something? So, the specific question is, like, programming-wise, 
how, what's the difference in mentality when we are approaching, let's say, VFX, uh, I mean, not, not VFX, SFX, yeah. SFX uh, I'm a graphic programmer, so it uh, yeah. gets mixed up, SFX or uh, music or whatnot. Um, yeah, because mainly like music involves like the utilization of like multiple different instruments. Yeah. And the uh, and SFX kind of s specifies on a few, uh, select few like footsteps or the ca the engine noises yeah. and stuff like that. They have so tones. when you're dealing with music, you work a lot closer also with a composer. Music is the joy of counting without knowing it, right? It's all about relationships. It's all about variations in terms of like ratios and stuff like that. And um, the hard part is actually coming up with those ratios that are pleasant. And chances are with your music, your sound, your like composer is gonna be like, yo dude, I don't need all this complicated system. Just give me a place where I can play my stuff. And that's good enough for a lot of games. The reason why games like No Man's Sky do it, of course, is because they have a need of endless variation, uh, one of the advantages of procedural audio. And I think as a programmer, your approach is for the music stuff is a lot more about um, creating tools for your composer to be able to prototype. Because the thing with procedure generation is like you get a, you create an example and it sounds good. How do you know it's going to sound good on the spectrum of endless variations that can come out, right? You need to create these tools. That's, that's the important part. You need to create tools for the actual people who are going to make this sound good to easily be able to debug, test, uh, come up with new ways. With procedural content based on pre-recorded sample, it's all about constraints. Ironically enough, the constraints are what makes a procedural system create good output, not all the crazy fancy maps behind it. Whereas for things like, like let's say, in GTA 5, which is like famous for using a lot of procedural sounds, when they're modeling a gun, the, uh, let's say the audio designer might give the, the engineer like some samples. So we're like, this is what I want to create. And together they create this, and that's that. It's a very short thing, and it's all about getting the believability that this is a gunshot across, and not as much about, the, let's say, the, the, the aspects of harmony or whatnot. Because it's SFX sort of thing. Yeah, right. basically. Okay, uh, I guess thanks. That's pretty much it. Welcome. Whoever. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so my question is related to, I have two questions basically. First is, have you seen like a little bit of friction when this idea of implementing procedural audio is talked to the game team because it, it will uh, require a lot of effort? Yeah. Uh, and the second question is, uh, is implementing MIDI for music using this approach is uh, easy or uh, like favorable event to do in Unity or does it yeah. require additional effort? So uh, for the first question, friction-wise, I think teams that are large enough, let's say AAA, they already know the stuff that I'm talking about. They're already doing it. Like it's rare to have a, let's say, a giant team that doesn't have some sound engineer that at the very least are creating all these samples, like pre-recording the samples procedurally, kind of replacing the folly thing. <coughs> Sorry, I'm dying. Uh, replacing the folly uh, scenes with, uh, uh, with pre-recorded mathematical stuff. However, the true, let's say, value comes from smaller teams, right? And if you can do a sound, like the piano I showed, I did on a weekend. If you can do this on a weekend, we should do it, obviously. If you see yourself looking at the system and being like, I have no idea what's going on, chances are you're not ready to ship that for an uh, actual commercial project. So go back on theory, read on a bit, do like a hobby project. And then when you come back to the team, you're like, guys, I got this. This is the starting point. That's a light at the end of the tunnel. I need five working days. And that's easy to budget in, right? And people know what's going on. So regarding your second question, uh, which was? About uh, the use of MIDI in uh, procedural audio. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, well, that's definitely a decision, right? I mean, if you don't need it, you don't need it, right? I, I think games that need it, they know they need it. Right? Like, um, again, games like No Man's Sky, they know that they need some ways of doing procedural music. Or even like with Hades, you, they need some music to kind of pair up with endless hours that people are going to put in. Um, in that aspect, you have no other option. However, it's not that insanely complicated. Uh, the thing that's truly a shame is that you have your audio system, which is mainly like two main libraries, which don't always play well with the engine of your choice. And also usually way more complicated than what you needed. 
Like the, the piano system I wrote can play pretty much any instrument and can play any piece you want. You just have to input the information per hand. If you're going to use one of those like big libraries, you're going to have a lot more overhead of maintenance and you need a lot of people with know-how. Uh, that's like the bigger problem. Do you write your own system or do you come up with something new? Um, depends on the capability of your team. If you have a confident audio engineer that says, one weekend we have our system, go for it. If you don't, maybe use another library. Okay, thank you so much. Pleasure. Hello, uh, I have a question. So um, regarding this, like you program audio, so can you export the audio when the mix engineer needs to mix the, the music, the sound design, the effects and everything, the voiceovers as well? Yeah. So does that work and does it work in the Unity or you ship that to a different engineer, then he makes it and then he sends it back and mm -hmm. then you again implement it. So how yep. does that work? So if you're deciding to um, write the code the way I did, your intention is I want to have this procedurally on the fly. So usually it's rare to be like write it back to some sort of thing. You might want to temporarily write it to RAM so that you can replay it a few seconds later for something else for cache and I don't know, for optimization purposes, but uh, rare, very rare. Um, however, as I said before, there are teams out there that are using procedural audio in a set of real-time thing. They are using it as a replacement for folly techniques of recording sounds. So I don't know if you have to like record the sound of a black hole. You can't send your engineer there and be like, go and capture that. Like, that's not, you know what I mean? So if, especially if you understand the rules that govern it, you could come up with a math, complicated mathematical, mathematical model that, and then your engineer has a chance of <clears throat> actually going over it and do whatever they need. So if you have a need of actually touching the sound, that would be more the approach that you have outside of an engine, a system that can generate these sounds, but they kind of also lose the, the advantage of uh, memory efficiency because then you're generating these sam unique samples and you have to actually ship with them and you're going back again to 10 hours of download time for the player. Thank you. Any other question? One in the back. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I had a question like regarding the music part itself. So uh, when you say procedural music, what part of it is actually procedural? Like mm -hmm. for example, you you could potentially manipulate some kind of a musical scale and then put it in some Phrygian mode or Dorian mode and yeah. like uh, change the feel of that music according to the environment that the player is playing in. Uh, or But that might not, like you said, sound yeah. pleasant, right? So what part of it is actually procedural and what part is already there? Yeah. Depends on what you need, right? Uh, considering the interest in procedural music, maybe I should have done a talk on procedural music. Um, and for musician, they say Bach or Bach, as the English say it, was a mathematician. And it's true. Music is all about relationships. There is no reason why you can't do those things procedurally, right? Uh, for anyone who plays, anyone here play, actually plays this music, uh, like instruments? Nice, 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 nice. Uh, artistic, uh, artistic crowd. Anyone here composes? Okay, so for those of you, you know the concept of keys, and you know that a lot of pieces are about counting, right? You, you're in a certain key and you count up and down with a certain mathematical relationship. You could define that mathematically. Historically, it doesn't, it doesn't work that great. Um, <laughs> mostly because um, you need a human hearing that listens to it and thinks about association. Like, what does this sound remind me of? So. To answer your question, it really depends on what you want to do. Like if I have a melody defining keys and it's being played just the way I'm doing it there, I could, and the melody is like predetermined. A composer said, this is what we are playing. I could easily change the sounds to sound more menacing. If I come down a pitch, let's say I'm in the middle C thing and I come down a, a bunch, that's easy to do. And if that's what your game does, good. Um, what most people do though is like they have a system where they know that okay this motif makes people feel that way and like some sort of wave uh, collapse function thing you know that this motif can combine with these motifs right and based on a certain input you might get a sequence of music or not it can be also it's not solvable 
So it really depends. You can do so many things. It can, but also simply be that like you take your strings and you decide to make the strings a bit more less a bass or maybe a bit more high pitch and that completely changes the feel of the music or you want your instruments to sound like they're distance or in a bigger room or in a smaller room everything is possible next just one there one there we one can there. take one last question sure hello hi hi uh, thanks for the session first off and uh, i wanted to understand like uh, you know basically uh, is it uh, possible please keep the microphone a bit closer yeah can you hear me now yeah i can hear you yeah so i basically wanted to understand is it possible to create like feedback loops in uh, procedural generation and any can you touch upon that a bit yeah a uh, feedback loop I, i don't think with feedback loop you mean what i think i mean because feedback loop in audio engineering is a really bad thing okay. it's when your filter goes back in itself yeah, yeah, and yeah that's going. what i was thinking yeah So is I that mean, what you want yeah like sometimes there are intentional right maybe like uh, you know in heavy metal and all there's a lot of feedback that is there, uh, generated okay. during the riffs and all so yeah. that's what i just wanted to understand is it possible yeah i mean you can create feedback loop uh, the question is how do you not do feedback loop that's okay. it <laughs> that's the hard part uh, you can of course you have a filter right and you have it's like a chain it's a graph problem you have it's a graph problem and you can have a filter and you can decide whatever happens to it the output of this can go back You can have like a mid filter thing, latency thing, where you record from the speaker, uh, from the microphone, and then you put that back in again. You can do whatever you set your mind to. How much of that you can do in Unity Engine, especially this like latency late fetching thing? I don't think you can do in Unity Engine, but uh, if you're in a big team, you can contact Unity. They have they set an engineer, and you can do that too. They just make a special build of the game, uh, engine for you, so you can do whatever you want. Okay, thank you. So thank you for coming guys if you have further questions you can come I'm going to be around you can just come and ask Cheers okay.